On the farm in New Zealand was the first introduction to driving. My father's car got beaten up by me, you know, day after day as I learnt to drive sideways and, you know, between gateposts and things. You'd identify every car that went past the road, looking at the dashboards, look, it does 100 miles an hour, which of course it never did. And then uh, when you started to drive it, you realised you could do it, it just felt a hand, you could heel and toe at the age of 12, and you had car control, and you could slide it, it didn't bother you. It's an art and a craft. When you just feel that slight drift, when you feel you're on the absolute limit, that you could get into trouble if you get it wrong. And it's walking that tightrope and just thinking, I'm going to walk that just a little bit more than, than someone else. And if this corner worries me, it's going to worry the others more. So you would make sure the most dangerous corner became your favourite corner. When you're already one of the fastest drivers in the world, occupying the front row of the Formula One grid, it may seem there's little you can be taught about driving. But there is one man who quietly, behind the scenes, has been taking the best of the best and making them quicker. You may have never heard of him, but he just might be the most influential person in Formula One today. My name is Rob Wilson, and I train racing drivers in a Vauxhall Astra. I decided I wouldn't start in New Zealand because I would see the international drivers come out. And of course, they would always be more competitive than the New Zealanders because of the road dust that they had on them. I just caught an aeroplane as soon as I'd saved up enough money to fly to England. You start off in, in Formula Ford in those days, Ford 2000, Formula 3, I did that for a number of years. Indy Lights in the USA, I've done Le Mans a few times, Daytona 24 hours, I don't know, 15 times, Sebring a race in America. So, so the sports cars, I uh, did NASCAR, I did about 20 races in that as well, so we're on the ovals, pounding around there. So pretty much, pretty much covered it. This place is, is called Bruntingthorpe and it, it's an ex-World War II airfield. It's now a proving ground. And uh, here I've managed to build in a, a, a circuit that pretty much covers everything. We can modify things, have hairpins, S's, fast corners, slow corners, things that cause problems. I've tried to get most of it in there because if you're using a normal racetrack, which I have done many times and you can do, uh, you don't necessarily get all the elements in there when it comes to becoming a racing driver. And for instance, you could spend a week testing at Mugello in Italy or racing there, and you'd never know that your car had a traction problem. It's one of those circuits that just doesn't show it up. So I tried to get everything in here. It covers everyone from the odd celebs that are going to do Top Gear or something um, to, to Formula One drivers, so uh, uh, 12 of the current grid. Rob, why the Astra? Why is that the right vehicle to help Formula One drivers or other motorsport legends improve their skills rather than the type of car that they would normally drive? Well, it's the right size. It, it's an easy car to manipulate. You can go from understeer to oversteer just by the way you move your hands and your feet or find neutrality. It brakes well. It's fast enough. It's surprisingly fast. People go, I didn't realize it would be this, this quick. Also, it's as tough as old boots. I used to say for years, if I was a doctor in the way in the outskirts of Scotland in the snow in the winter, and I wanted something that I know would always work, yeah, I'd pick a Vauxhall. Is that not so different from motorsport cars that it completely changed it, or this provides the right platform even on front-wheel drive? Yes, and that's a question that, that does often get asked, because you know, the difference with a front-wheel drive car, if the back end's coming out, you'd put your foot down. If, if the rear in a rear-wheel drive car, you'd probably ease off to stop doing it. But a drive, a racing driver, or even someone who just drives a racing car, and there is a difference, um, they un almost uh, intuitively do that. You know, it, so that part, uh, gets taken care of straight away. The rest of it is we're trying to find a neutrality. It's your relationship with the surface where you become at one with the car, the car becomes at one with the surface, and you become at one with the surface. And you can almost transcend the car. So it's neutrality we're looking for, and you can do that front wheel drive or rear wheel drive. A Formula One driver comes to you between between races in the season, what are they trying to get and what are you able to help them with? What do they learn on a day here with you? It's usually what do I have to do to just cross the finish line sooner. You don't necessarily make them faster racing drivers, but you do get them to cross the finish line sooner because they're already fast. And you often don't know until you're sitting there with them in the passenger seat. I, I will have done a lap time, pretend two minutes or one minute 50 or what it would be. And they say, oh, this is 150.7, there's seven tenths missing here. And then you are feeling what they're doing. You might notice an excess of, of steering wheel movement, boxing at shadows, going into corners, claiming that they're waiting to feel the grip 
when it's coming, you say, no, no, you, you just, it's an anxiety attack, really, <clears throat> because nothing's really happening there. You don't know, but then we're always using the stopwatch as well, so we've got the lie detector running. After a while, you think, ah, every time I do this, I get that, and it helps to train the brain. When you're staring death in the face, bodies tighten up a little bit. If a child runs out in front of you on the road, the tendency is to go, bang, I've got to stop. You know? But if you can train your brain to go, da da, it will stop sooner. But training your brain to do that under maximum pressure, it takes time. If you have a, a cup of tea in your hand and you walk up the stairs, you can get to the top of the stairs without spilling it because you're moving your hips, your knees, your, all this to stop doing it. If you go to the bottom of the stairs and you put a newspaper under your arm and you try and carry it up the stairs, it'll spill. Well, if you're like this with your driving, that spilling tea, that's your relationship with the surface. And that's what we don't want. Can you list some of the people that you've taught here? Well, obviously there's a lot and there's a lot that we, that we don't mention, but a couple of the Finnish drivers, obviously Kimi has been here and, and Valtteri and Danny Kvyat we're working with quite a lot at the moment. So what's it like being in a car, helping Kimi Raikkonen learn to drive faster than he already can? He's just a good guy. He's got a good black sense of humor and he's funny and he's just a yeah, really, really good driver. You know, once you're in, in, a, in an Astra, you know, everyone's the same. So even from top front of the grid Formula One drivers, you know, former world champions down to well, me, it's, it's the same process, the same learning experience, the same techniques of teaching. Everything is identical. The person is different. You may need to work on, on different aspects of, with, with, with people, but yeah, the process is, is identical. There's nothing different. How do you assess how good someone like me is to start with? And then how do you work on pushing someone like me forward to become faster. You can pretty much extrapolate it, you know, after about two laps, three laps, just going around. That's all it takes. Yeah, you can, you can often pick it up in the first lap or so, and then it's just a matter of how big is the job going to be? You know, there are these elements, I don't know what it will be yet, you know, but... <laughs> it might be a bigger job than you well, think. Well, we don't, yeah. we don't know. It can, be, it can be easier than you think. What do you think is that makes you the person to come to for Formula One drivers and others to, to get better? I think there are thousands of instructors out there doing it. One needs to be able to x-ray right into the brain of the person as to what it is that's stopping this person doing something, getting a feel for the person you know, and caring about it and then being able to think in a, a structured way where we, you know, these, these 20 things of pretend that we've got to go through and we get one thing right, another thing right, another thing right. But I, it's, it's a matter of having, I think, empathy with the, the person you're with. It's a very human thing. You've got to be a fan of talent and think if we could just move this forward five atoms a minute you know, and come out a little bit further ahead than we came in. That's a huge victory. And, you know, and I love watching the development of people. In the very same Vauxhall Astra that some of the most famous drivers in the world have sat, I'm about to get the world's most sought after driving lesson. Rob's teaching principles are all about understanding the physics of driving, how your physical movements translate to the car's behavior, how weight transfer changes how a car reacts, and crucially, how to use that to your advantage. Rob teaches sympathy for how a car wants to be treated and how to ask more of it than you thought you could. The rate that you move your body, the rate you tell a car what's coming next. When we come to turn a corner, I'll say, turn now. But I don't mean this, you know. It means this. See that there? It's nothing. It's got nothing to do with the line on the corner. It's the beginning of a weight transfer to tell the car what's coming next. It makes a huge difference. And you drive a car as much with your feet as you do with your hands. You think, I'm gonna go bang on the brake pedal. There should be a, a minuscule introduction to the brake pressure. In most cars, it doesn't matter how well they build a car, the rear brakes get the message a fraction later to the, than the fronts. When we're out here, we see all the time, yeah, the car stops slightly better. Yeah, the corner is slightly shorter. To illustrate, Rob showed me how fast the car can go. There's an old saying that those who can't teach. I can tell you Rob most certainly can. In the wet, in a front wheel drive Astra, he did things you'd never imagined possible and instantly it became clear why he is so sought after as an instructor. To give me something to aim for, Rob set a lap time and then it was my turn. I never really appreciated how fast a car like that can go. It can go a lot faster than you think it can. Apparently 153.1 was the lap time. We're going to need a sundial to measure this one. 
Racing driver excuses to start with. It was wet, but even after a good few sighting laps, I was a full 10 seconds off Rob's pace. Rob has carefully crafted a circuit that has exactly what he needs to be able to tell where a driver can improve, and it very quickly became apparent to him where I could start making up some time. I've had performance driving lessons from a variety of people over the years, and the difference in how Rob teaches was immediately very clear. All previous track tuition I've had was aimed at novices or intermediate drivers, maybe even entry-level professionals. It was about building up speed gradually, understanding the basics and above all being safe. Rob includes all of the above, but all he wants you to do is go faster. Where everywhere else you can learn to be smooth with the car in order to keep control, Rob taught me how to communicate with the car so you can be harsher, asking more of it than you thought you could. Treat the car with respect and it will reward you and even a humble Astra can fly. The second started falling off the lap times again and again and after just an hour or two the difference was remarkable. And the time is 1.55.0 and, and no cones over an no actual le legitimate... 100% legal. 100% <laughs> legal. The front row of the grid because that's the second best time of the day. Yeah. Well, still, still a couple of seconds off your time, and, and it has dried out a little bit, but... Well, a little bit, but nevertheless, what an impressive jump. Well, it started at 2.11, and yeah. even if you factor in you know, five seconds for figuring out the lap, that's a net gain of 10 seconds in an hour or two of driving. That's a career-changing improvement. I feel not just massively privileged to have had this opportunity, but to be sandwiched in between some, some actual real drivers as you're, well. You're sandwiched in between two drivers who were in the Austrian Grand Prix <laughs> last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> when you're concentrating on your inputs and the physicality of how you're, move, you're physically moving your body and on what your inputs you're putting when, you, you don't have time to be scared or really think about no, how quickly you're going. Oh, I did this and I got that, I did this and I got that. It was functional, it was just thinking about the, the, the job in hand and, right. and, and trimming like, away. And then there's the lap time and the time just falls away. Yeah. So what does a Formula One driver who's like in the dry is really pushing it and they go, what's, what, what kind of time are they putting down? Uh, well, we, in the bone dry in this car, we'd eventually, we'd probably be looking at the 148. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, about 48. Well, it shows the difference between someone who is, is, is happy to drive relatively fast like myself and a Formula One driver on a sub two minute lap is a still a good seven or eight seconds. That's the difference between. Um, yeah, yes, but if like, you came back and did a few days, you know, suddenly the 55 becomes a 53, becomes a 52, but, and all of a sudden the end is in sight. Yeah. Uh, and they think, ah, oh, now what do I need to do to get to where I want to get to? And, and you do it. Formula One, NASCAR, even rally drivers come here to this track to drive this car in the hope to gleam just a fraction of Rob's wealth of knowledge and experience. Racing teams bend over backwards to try and get a slot on his schedule in the hope he can elevate the newest crop of talent to the next best thing on the grid. Rob Wilson's lessons make the difference between fast drivers and the fastest drivers. Next time you see your favorite F1 pilot do that little bit better than he did last race, it's very likely that a session with Rob in his Astra is why.